good morning. This is your General Housing and Military Affairs Committee in the Vermont State House um, via Zoom. Um, and we are going to be working on S-237 again today. Um, we started to have a pretty lengthy conversation about this yesterday, and um, I want to take, we have a double session today between now and noon, and then noon 30 until 2 before we start dealing with the budget in another Zoom meeting. Um, so I really want this to be considered a work session. Um, we know where people stand on each of the topics so far, whether you support it or don't. Um, we're pretty aware of that, but this is to try to work through some of the language to make sure that at the very least the language is right and that the policy that we're talking about is where we can get it to a point of voting it up or down. So um, with that, we also un are under the, the, the knowledge that Ellen may have to leave us. So actually, um, I think I'm going to have to try to actually, Mike, will you be able to bring up S237 as a shared screen? Yes, I can do that. Okay. That's going to be the easiest thing to do rather than try to have me do that. Um, but I wanted to start off today because with um, Commissioner Walk, who is here to follow up on some of the testimony that he gave last Friday on the um, Tri Park mobile home section of the bill. And we also, I don't know if it's been shared yet. I, if it's not, then I'll get it to, um, I'll get it to Mike to share. There's a suggestion of language that and perhaps the commission will have the suggestion of language that we're looking for. So um, with that, commissioner, welcome back. And uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Representative Stevens. Uh, for the record, Peter Walk, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, I really appreciate this, the, the, the changes of the language that have come about over the last few days. I think it uh, really closely matches what, what I asked of you in the testimony last week. Um, there are a couple of things that I would uh, recommend, and I think there's a fair amount of, of alignment with what you may hear from Earhart later. I just want to comment on a couple of things in, in his draft as well, if there's if that would be helpful, just to help clarify things for you. Um, the so that we're talking about Section 10, the mobile home park infrastructure piece. Um, the I appreciate the 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 removal of of the relocation component as that's not supportable by by that funding source. It's something certainly my department is supportive of generally. Um, and I have been just, just for the committee's awareness, uh, been in touch with, the, with Vermont Emergency Management about the potential for using hazard mitigation grant uh, program monies to support that effort because that's really what that program is designed for in many ways is to take those known hazards uh, you know, flood hazards or buildings and flood hazards or people in flood hazards and figure out ways to address them in advance of the next flood flooding issue. And so my hope is that that will be helpful. Um, it, it, it can be a, 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 sl a slow process, but it, the master planning work that the that Tri Park and the, the Town of Broadway have done it will really advance, uh, have really uh, set them ahead of, of the rest of the process. Um, so the only um, the only change that I'm recommending to your your existing draft for um, for section ten there are two the the first is in a one um, you discuss uh, to al allowing for the improvements to wastewater and stormwater infrastructure needs we would recommend including drinking water in those needs as well because that is a, another component uh, that is a challenge for the community and one want to make sure that we're addressing all of those potential pieces. Uh, the, the second proposed change that I, that I would recommend to the committee um, is in A3, uh, where it talks about mobile home parks and other small communities. Um, and I think this is where there's an alignment between what you'll hear from Aaron later our perspective is that that we should stick to the focus on the mobile home parks. Other small communities could mean anything to anybody, um, and we really uh, are focused on all uh, you know all communities in Vermont already. And if we want to give mobile home parks the specific focus that they they want, we recommend striking 
and other small um, communities from a 10 a three. Uh, the, the open question and one I would um, advise you to leave the language the same, um, and, but you know, it's, it's more of a, it's not a policy disagreement, it's more of a sort of a question of how are we going to, you know, sort of do the best that we can for this community. Um, the, in, in A1, there is a um, there is a question about whether or not we should include loan forgiveness as part of the tools available to us. I, I want to be clear that as part of restructuring, which is how the language is currently uh, stated, we believe that covers uh, the possibility of loan forgiveness. Um, whether or not loan forgiveness is available is a is a open question at the moment and not one that we fully control. Um, it is a, a question of, of legal authority that the EPA has to weigh in on, as well as whether or not we have subsidy available. Um, so it, it's a, I, I, I'll try to stay at the 10,000 foot level, but essentially every year when we get our grant from the EPA that helps fund the, the revolving loan programs, we have a certain component of that that can be used for quote unquote subsidy, essentially for loan forgiveness and other tools that we use to try to help um, uh, communities that really need that support to be able to move forward with projects. Um, so it, 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 the, we, can, we can only offer loan forgiveness if there is subsidy available in the year in which those loans were given still remaining. And so they, it's a bit of a, a process to sort through whether those exist and whether they've potentially been committed elsewhere as we have lots of needs around the state. And so we just um, want to make sure that we're, we're, we will evaluate all of our potential tools to help this community. Um, we just, we think restructuring sort of accounts for all of that work. I uh, would encourage you to stick with that language. The only other component that I would add to that, and maybe it's you know, if you do decide to use the the forgiveness language to make sure that it's not a restructuring or forgiveness, uh, we'd like to be able to bring all our tools to bear, and the or language suggests to me that it's one or the other, um, and so I would rather have it uh, all of our tools be available to us, which is one of the other reasons why I would like to stick with restructuring. Um, and then, if, if I may, I, I didn't mention this in, in my contact to you this, this morning, um, but the for, um, for the river corridors and, and flooding language, um, I appreciate the, it now reflecting the, um, the, the actual, the, the rule, uh, the specific rule and having that cross reference work. Um, it might be simpler um, to simply reference that that it's that the project is with or the building is located within a river corridor as mapped by ANR or within a flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA. Um, that's clearer. The rules kind of get to that in a backwards fashion, but it is, um, not necessarily as direct and explicit as it could be, and it will help uh, make sure that um, those potential applicants are, have kind of clarity on what we mean. Um, so we map river quarters, FEMA rep maps, flood hazard areas. If it's in either one of those, then the project would be eligible. Does that make sense? So what we would, what I would recommend is um, that it's with it, within an area located within a river corridor as mapped by the Agency of Natural Resources or within the flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA and, and remove the reference to the rule. I think it gets to the same place. I think it provides more clarity for, for potential applicants for these, for these uh, tax credits. All right, and are are you in this section that is that deals with tri park or 
in the earlier qualified flood mitigation project definition? Uh, in the qualified flood project mitigation mitigation project that uh, as you see on your screen now, that's that's the area where this edit would come into play. So actually I'm looking at this this language and it says, okay, on, on line 15 and 16 it says located within an area subject to the flood hazard area and river corridor rule or within the flood hazard area as mapped by the um, by FEMA. Um, is there such a thing as a flood hazard area and river corridor rule? Or is it's what you're asking for is to say, is to cut this reference that's highlighted right now and say to, to say within an area subject to um, mapping conducted by, by the flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA um, and uh, uh, and the areas, I don't know what the proper name would be that are mapped by the state. Uh, sure, and I can provide I can provide this language. I can show it to you now if you if you'd like. Um, it's it's simply referencing that the jurisdiction of the flood hazard area and river corridor rule, which does exist, is there. It, it refers to the mapping work that we do, right? So jurisdictional triggers are the the maps that are produced, and so rather than refer jurisdiction for your you know sort of eligibility to the rule. It makes more sense to refer to the maps, which is established jurisdiction for the rule, if that makes sense. Um, so it, so it, rather than saying as it stands now, what I recommend it say is qualified flood mitigation project means any combination of structural and non-structural changes to a building located within a river corridor as mapped by the Agency of Natural Resources or within the flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA. And, and make it really crystal clear for everybody. Those maps are all available online. They can go on, see what their, what, whether their project's located in one of those areas and whether they're eligible. Okay. Um, Re Representative Gonzalez has a question. Thank you. Um, I had a question back in terms of the restructuring, um, the loan restructuring and um, you answered it a little bit, but just to get um, uh, crystal clear on it, in I'm, I'm not hearing opposition to adding a language about loan forgiveness as long as it's inclusive and provides the flexibility um, based upon what the rules allow and all of that. Yes, I, I think as long you know the 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 loans to the extent possible language really provides us with you know sort of the legal flexibility to do what what's available to us. Um, I just you know I I, I want to make sure that we don't limit ourselves. Um, so if it I, I am comfortable with whatever approach you take, provided that you're aware of that as a potential challenge and it doesn't limit us our ability to to do a number of things because usually we can bring to bear a number of tools mm -hmm. that reduce the overall premiums. Great, thank you. So that's restructuring and for forgiveness rather than or. That's what you had mentioned earlier. Yeah, and you might, you might say including consideration of restructuring and uh, for loan forgiveness of those loans, right? So that it's, that we're considering using both um, I, j rather, you know, just, I think saying and as it states now suggests that that can definitely occur and it may not be able to occur for, for all or, uh, of those loans. So just based on where, as of the considerations I've said before. So that's, that's my only, my only feeling I, you know, Ellen's capable hands can draft language that matches that I I intent. Uh, but that was really my, um, my hope. Okay. Thank you. Please do, Alan. Um, just <laughs> take that note, please. Um, all right, committee, any further questions for Commissioner Walk before, so we can let him go? Before, um, okay, seeing none, thank you, Commissioner. Um, we will, um, I mean, I don't think the changes suggested by um, advocates is too far beyond what we just talked about, but we'll take a look at those when those get posted. And um, I would like to call on um, Representative Dolan, if I could, um, and ask her thoughts on this material um, in 
um, in this particular case. Car Carrie, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. And and um, and good morning, Commissioner Walk. Um, my my question, I do have a follow up question, if I may, on Section Ten. Um, and just for my own clarity, I didn't quite understand the, the initial change. I think it, it had talked about the original bill, and perhaps this language is still in place, but it talks about the implementation of the master plan and the Deerfield River and Lower Connecticut River Tactical Basin Plan, which is more about the relocation of the Tri Park um, mobile home facility, fundamentally because the location of these homes are in the FEMA floodway, which is considered the highest risk section of a river corridor high, uh, to future flooding. And so how, how would we kind of reconcile the recommendations contained in the tactical basin plan about um, actual relocation, and uh, and and with the alternative, which is just to to try to harden the current homes that are in place. Typically, we 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 try to to extent possible to to move people in safer areas, and flooding oftentimes exposes where we have the highest risk properties. And, and I know uh, this area is, um, has a notorious reputation for flooding on a frequent basis. Sure, thanks for your question, Representative. Just, we had a long conversation about this last week. Uh, the, the intent of the Tri Park Master Plan contains two, two main topic areas. One is the relocation of those homes outside of the, uh, the floodway. The other is a, a addressing the, the cost and essentially the overall revenue impacts to this community um, that the loans represent and the ability of the state to help reduce those costs. What we talked about on, on Thursday or Friday last week, Karen, sorry, I, they all run together at this point, um, was the fact that the SRF uh, dollars weren't available for the relocation. Um, we're not opposed to the concept of relocation. In fact, we're supportive of it, and which is why we've been reaching out to the um, to see if there's an opportunity to leverage those resources, as you know well, um, to see if that's a pot of money that could be used to do exactly what is called for in the master plan, at least that component of it. The, the, what we're talking about here is what can we do to reduce the costs that the tri the tri park currently bears uh, that are related to its water and you know water and stormwater and and drinking water infrastructure and then how we um, how we address that and so that's that's why those two things have been somewhat separated out. It's not a question of lack of support um, for the effort. It's a question of the way it was previously drafted. It suggested that the SRF should be used for the relocation. And, and that's not an eligible expense. Um, and as I went back and reviewed the master plan uh, on Friday, the, um, it, that wasn't actually what the master plan called for. It called for a funding source to be named later uh, to help with that. And what I would suggest is that most appropriate funding source may be the hazard mitigation program, which does allow for the buyout or relocation of, of homes or mobile homes in this context. Thank you for that, that clarification. Yes, I, I do understand that uh, the SRF hasn't been used for this purpose, but, um, but certainly the after typically post flooding is when those funds typically become available for relocation. But I know every year we have some, some funds due to the frequency of flooding in the hazard mitigation fund uh, under the Department of Public Safety, uh, Department of Public Safety. So it would be helpful to flag that funding source for um, possible reloc relocation. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah. 
And and just just to further clarify, the the money that I'm talking about is the hazard mitigation program, which is irrespective of uh, a actual flooding event. Obviously, there's some relationship to those flooding events because there's an indication that it is a hazard and an ongoing hazard. It to me, this is about the the, the hazard mitigation program is about looking forward. How do we prevent the next flooding event from happening? Um, and so it, it is generally not tied to the an actual the the money coming from an event, and so that that's where I think that Aaron is work. I did reach out to Senator Ballant and Representative Long to sort of discuss the possibility of this as a path forward, and I'm happy to work and help facilitate that process to make sure that we get to that second leg of 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 the plan and the technical the the master plan and the technical basin plan um, to get to that. Um, that relocation component. Um, so, all right. Uh, thank you, Representative Dolan. Uh, Representative um, Commissioner Walk, let me on line eight. You had suggested is it line eight that you had suggested to allow for improvements to drinking water, comma wastewater and stormwater and infrastructure needs? Is that what you had suggested? Yes, please. And that, I mean, I'm noticing down on line fifteen that that lines up with the drinking water state um, plan. Is that right? Yes, and I believe at least one of the loans to the park or to the town on behalf of the park is a drinking water loan, and so it should reflect that full suite. Okay, Representative Dolan. I think this is one of those um, situations where we have, as a state, struggled periodically ac across the state with communities having homes in way in in floodable or flood pr pl prone areas and one of the one of the historic issues that we've been grappling with over time has been uh, making improvements to water drinking water wastewater in these areas that only are to get flooded in the future and it would damage those public investments. And it's why relocation is the most cost-effective solution. Um, and, but yet we've made these improvements in, in other places in, and in Brattleboro as well, uh, uh, water, wastewater improvements in homes in floodplains. I, I wanna flag that because that is um, something that Historically, the state has been trying to get away from because you're actually exposing the state from making uh, investments that are only get damaged and thereby questioning whether that's a smart use of, of limited funds. Um, you know, I think fundamentally we all want uh, to provide for safe water and drinking water and wastewater services, but we, we um, also want to keep people safe and to to um, ensure that our investments are done in a real thoughtful way so as to make sure they achieve the long-term benefits we seek. So I, I want to just flag that that um, those two lines there. So flagging it for- to, to really flag, think about. Well, flagging it again from a, I mean, this language is specific to, um, it's specific to the Tri Park Master Plan and, and what's been going on there um, for the last eight or nine years in particular. Are you talking about a larger? Um, are you talking about a larger policy issue, a statewide policy issue, or something just related to this particular, um, this narrow instance? Because this doesn't create a precedent for. I mean, it can create a precedent, but it doesn't create. Um, the language is pretty limiting right here to to the tri park stuff. Or can you help me out with it there? Yes, you're you're correct in in that you've identified the that this language is specific to one occasion, but it is incremental, and it reflects yet one more example where the state is putting state resources into areas that are flood prone. And, and with potential for flood damage. And so I, I mentioned that as um, something we should be concerned about. So there's, I, a, there's a balance there of how to ensure that we're making 
that we have such a demand statewide for uh, water wastewater services uh, and we want to serve um, all homes with that need yet we also need to be thoughtful as to where we're putting those limited state dollars um, to ensure that we're uh, not investing in areas that are uh, could potentially result in higher costs from from flood recovery. So I would I would uh, thanks, Gary. I, I agree with you completely in sort of in concept. If we were talking about the construction of a new wastewater facility or wastewater infrastructure in the floodway or in any of the you know sort of surrounding area, then that might be a, a different piece. What what I understand to be the issue we're trying to fix is essentially there are high cost loans that the that the park is currently obligated to that they would um, that they are looking for relief from the state to see if there's an opportunity to make those existing loans more cost effective for them and that's so it's it's not new infrastructure on the ground it's uh, it's work that's been previously done and therefore needs. Uh, they're looking for some re relief. And so we're happy to look to see if that relief is possible. Um, I, I, I would not support the, the construction of, of expensive new infrastructure in the, in the floodway. I, you know, I agree with you that the, the, the most appropriate uh, approach is to, is to uh, relocate those loans. What we're just talking about is, is the existing loans themselves. Representative, I'm going to have to apologize. I do have to, to leave to attend to another matter, but um, I am a, available and happy to come back if you have questions or need uh, further assistance um, throughout your uh, your work on this bill and trying to get it accomplished. I know where you are. No, I, I appreciate you coming in clarif clarifying. I think we're going to take a quick look at the language that was proposed through um, um, the advocates through Jen or through Jen Holler. Um, I think it's going to be pretty close. I think there's going to be a conversation about the small communities. Um, and I'm cur you know, I'll be curious to know, and, and maybe we can talk about that concept at a different time, but just that idea of why, why take out small communities if we're dealing with, you know, areas that are riverside um, in the future, you know, it's areas that are riverside, but are not mobile home parks. Um, I think that's what we're talking about, but I, 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 I do appreciate that it's not precise. So I'd like to find out what, why that language was, um, was put in. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, Mike, can you take the, 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 the bill down for the time being? Um, and I, I did want, well, Carrie, you have to leave in a minute, right? Yes, in about 10 minutes or so. Okay, um, Chris Cochran is here. And while we had um, Representative Dolan had, had a question about the use and um, the, the use about uh, uh, the tax credits and how they may be, you were curious about how they might be used or, or misused. Um, and I wanted Chris Cochran, who who manages the, who has at least, I don't know what it, if he's still managing the tax credits up front, but it, he has extensive experience with the management of those tax credits. Um, Chris, if I was wondering if you could take a minute while we still have Dylan listed on, on the tax credit question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chris Cochran from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you for having me. Um, I, for several years, I administered the state's downtown and village center tax credit program. Um, the program was aimed at increasing the vitality of our community centers because um, the, the financing to make these building improvements just didn't pencil out. Um, as Representative Dolan knows well, we did extensive studies um, post Irene on how do we keep our centers active and strong in, in with the, the risks that are inherent. You know, we are getting warmer and wetter. Um, we do know the next flood is going to happen. Um, it's just a matter of when. Um, at the time, um, post Irene, this was uh, considered as 
an, an opportunity to do hazard mitigation, use the tax credit program to do hazard mitigation. It's a fairly limited pool of, of eligible applicants. So it is, it is just commercial buildings. So these are income producing buildings within our existing village centers. Um, these are places that are not going to move in any time soon. And in many cases, they are located on managed channels. I think an easy example for everybody to understand is Montpelier. Montpelier is a riprap channel. It is never going to move. The, the meander of that stream is never going to be restored. It is unlikely in our lifetime without significant federal money that Montpelier will ever move. So the option you're left with is if we know another flood is going to come and you know this is going to cause significant business interruption and threaten life and property, what steps can we take right now to make these communities more resilient? They do need to plan ahead. They do need to make these investments. There's kind of post Irene, there's a fatigue and there's been less interest in making investments to make your building safer. And what this was intended to is to target in these very specific areas that are critical to our culture, brand and economy. How can we make these buildings safer and better prepared for the next flood? So when, when the next flood does happen, they bounce back quickly and they're not completely devastated for six months. Sorry, I keep I, oh, muting. I, sorry, I couldn't I, hear I, anybody. <laughs> sorry, I mean, I, there's so much traffic going on outside yeah. with road construction that I just find myself muting more often than I did a, a few weeks ago um, and then forgetting. So Representative Dolan, do you have a um, follow-up question at all before um, for Chris? Uh, thank you, Chris, and, and good to see you again. I, I do would encourage the committee to put specificity City then with respect to this tax credit, when you uh, indicate in that bill, I don't have the most current language, but the Senate version included non-structural and structural improvements. And as I uh, had mentioned yesterday, that can be interpreted pretty broadly. There are uh, improvements that are considered um, strategies to help to flood proof buildings, uh, but they could in fact exacerbate flooding, flood hazard risks or erosion risks on adjacent properties downstream. And uh, I, I appreciate the, the explanation by um, Mr. Cochran. I would encourage the language to then specify that the improvements we're talking about are in building improvements such as elevating Utilities, for example, is a is an is one flood proofing strategy that wouldn't necessarily change the or heighten the flood hazards on adjacent properties. Chris, you're out. Um, Sorry, uh, if I could add, all these changes are gonna be regulated by the municipality that has duly adopted flood plain and hazard mitigation ordinances, which say you can't increase the risk to downstream properties. So I, I think it's a fair concern, but I do think it will be administered through the local um, bylaw. Um, if I may, um, um, Chair. Um, yes. Steven, I, I, I agree with you, uh, however, only about 50 or so states have more than uh, the FEMA minimum flood, uh, floodplain bylaws, flood uh, risk bylaws, and thereby um, they're somewhat narrow in scope uh, and wouldn't necessarily address some actions such as placement of a berm, for example, along a riverbed, uh, riverbank, or um, some sort of diversion at that facility, even though under FEMA rules, you would still need to conduct 
an elevation study to determine whether those actions would cause or contribute to uh, the height of water. I think the biggest risk what we've experienced in Vermont are erosion related impacts, what we call fluvial erosion hazards, which are not mapped by FEMA, not part of the flood hazard bylaws that are the minimum standards. And I, I again would encourage for clarity's sake that you would specify the type of um, flood proofing would be building, building related only for to qualify for these tax credits. Okay, um, we have a question. Um, are you okay right now, Chris? Yeah, I understand the concern, yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Representative Gonzalez. Um, and my question was actually for Representative Dolan and um, she just kind of answered that and just in terms of the suggestion for the specificity. And so what I heard was um, your recommendation is that the language is building only um, uh, uh, flood mitigation projects. So thank yes. you. Okay. Um, any further comments on this section at this time being with um, Carrie and with Representative Dolan and um, All right. Well, thank you, Carrie, for for stopping in, and um, good luck for the rest of the day. Um, we'll see you at least in thumbnail size in a couple hours. Thank you. And if you have any further questions, I um, I'm be happy to on other portions of the bill. I'd be happy to have those conversations as well. Okay. Thank and, you for and, this opportunity and, to listen in. Sure, and, and just one request, if you do have time to, if you have specific sketched ideas about what you, of the comments you were just making in terms of where it would fit exactly in the language that, as it exists right now, um, that would of course would be helpful too. Great, thank you. Good to see you all, take care. All right. Um, so we're back to um, S-237 and are we satisfied with leaving this section alone for the time being? Or do we wanna talk about where we wanna, I mean, it sounds like there's just a couple of language things that we would need to clean up in order to take care of this bill that's Brattleboro area specific. Um, does anybody have th thoughts on it? Right now, I mean, we had a couple of suggestions from the commissioner, the language that was um, posted. Actually, why don't we just go right there right now? Um, Mike, if you could post the language that is um, uh, from Jen Holler that, that talks about this same language, that would be helpful. All right, so scroll down. Okay, so um, so I think in this particular language, what I'm seeing is that on line three, what the commissioner requested was and forgiveness, not or. Um, in this language, the other small communities. So this would make it specific to uh, mobile home parks. And the other thing that the commissioner was requesting was that we add improvements specifically to the town of Prattleboro and the Tripart Cooperative that um, to allow for improvements to drinking water, comma, <laughs> wastewater and stormwater infrastructure needs. Um, Representative Dolan felt slightly differently about that and she asked us to flag it. So here it is flagged. Um, do we have thoughts on this or are we find adding drinking water to this particular language?
Okay, I'm not seeing any um, hands raised. So I would, um, and I guess I would have one last question for Chris Cochran on this section um, about the date for the report. That's a conventional reporting date and um, in section B. And I'm just curious to know if that still works um, or do you need to go out to April 15th? Um, that date is fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Howard. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say I agree with adding the uh, drinking water. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so this is section 10. Um, I don't have, um, Mike, so let's go back to section 10 then. So Ellen, do you have these, Ellen, are you still here? Yep. So do you have those suggestions? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna be looking for S237 on my computer for a minute here. Um, Because there is more, um, at the end of this bill, there are two studies. Well, let me go, let's, first of all, we, we talked about the study, actually, I'm sorry, under the Vermont Housing Incentive Program, this is on, um, Mike, this is at the very end. This is the last section of the bill. There is a section on the Vermont Housing Incentive Program. That is something that we know from H739. We had a conversation about it, but what it, it actually ended up as a $6.2 million program in the Corona Relief Fund COVID response at, at H966. And so I don't think that this is um, necessary right now. Um, and so I'm just putting it on the table if we're okay with um, cutting it. If anybody has any thoughts about it? Um, um, this is uh, Chris Cochran. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I got a feedback from Josh, um, you know, Commissioner Hanford, on this, and he said, if possible, the governor's office would like to keep this provision enabled um, for future use. Um, I explained to him some of the challenges and. Um, about enabling something without money, um, but he asked that it be kept. Um, so just passing that on. Thanks. I'm sorry. So that request came via um, the commissioner? Um, the governor's office via the commissioner, yes. Okay. Representative Hango. Thank you. Um, could you please point to where that program is in this bill? I'm not finding it in the copy that I'm looking at, but I might be looking at the wrong draft. So um, it is not in the draft that I posted yesterday. It's in the bill as it came over from the Senate. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and I guess at this point, um, I just want to make a comment that we're really taking a leap of faith because a lot of this is out of our area of expertise. So it was helpful to have Representative Dolan here and the commissioner because much of this language is, is foreign to some of us. And um, we're really kind of leaving it in their hands to craft the appropriate language in terms of water quality, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, does anybody, so we have um, Representative Byron. Yes, uh, I just, what copy are we working off of right yeah, now? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, so I'm gonna take responsibility for this. When I was talking to Ellen and, and she presented the, um, she presented the uh, strike all amendment. I had put in my notes to delete this section because we had already done the program. And I'm going back to right now, I'm going back to the bill as it was passed through um, the Senate because these sections still exist and, and 
we need to go over them and decide as a committee whether to cut them or not. And so, um, so find okay. your Senate, find your find your Senate version so of this. Passed. Okay. Yes. Is that right, Ellen? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. No, my apologies for that confusion. Um, so, Ellen, actually, can we work? So, Ellen, I'm going to ask you then um, if I'm looking at right now. I'm looking at the Senate as passed, and what was um, what was Section 23 is about the Vermont Housing Incentive Program, and that is not in our current version of the bill. So, I just want. Um, and you didn't write that section. That's David's. David wrote that section. This is pretty much lifted directly from 739. Um, uh, yeah, David wrote it, so I don't know specifically. But right. Yeah. So the question we'll have to answer about this section is if any revisions have to be made to it in order to just make it. I, I don't know that. I know that there was a request in this, and, and um, we will. Um, to have to take a look at it to make sure that it has um, doesn't have to be changed if this is just remains enabling legislation. Um, section twenty two, Alan, did that stay in the in the new bill, and which was the Vermont State Treasurer Credit Facility for Local Investments? Yes, that is in the strike all amendment. It's section 11 and it's on page 19. Okay, and the point of this section once again was to um, take away the specificity of the amount authorized and was written to say the treasurer may use amounts available to provide financing for infrastructure projects in Vermont mobile home parks. So this tags along with the section on not, I mean, it goes beyond the Brattleboro Tri-Park, but this has to do with her being able to develop programs that are um, for these purposes. We haven't visited this section since we had the walkthrough, so I'm just double checking to make sure that I have the um, what that new language authorizes. Um, and I did not draft this section either, so I am not. I don't have a deep understanding of it, but it is. It's yes, I didn't change it from as it passed the Senate in the new strike call. Actually, Ellen, can I just pass something on? I mean, I'm, I'm, and I again, I'm apo I apologize, committee. No, the re representative Zod, there's clearly not a clean copy of what we're considering because I just brought up a section that came from the Senate bill because it was in. I inadvertently left it out of my request for the strike all. So, if we want to go back to the strike all, and Ellen, if there's any other sections that I that I that especially that had to do with studies, um, then. And then if, let's just stick to the strike all amendment. But if there's anything left in there, um, for instance, there was a study about short-term rentals. Um, we've had a request to say, let's not do that. Um, it's It was actually, it, most of what's being asked for was just done in a needs assessment that was issued by the Housing Finance Agency. Um, there is a study about uh, elder housing that I don't know, because I, I, I don't have it in front of me, is, um, is that in the strike all? Ellen. I can't hear you. No, I don't think so. Um, All right. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just, again, apologizing that I, that I requested those things to be cut. And I just want to make sure that we're talking about them. They were requested. Um, they were, they were, they've been identified by numerous sources as being um, uh, either redundant uh, there is language in the Older Vermonters Act that talks about elder housing. So many of the same issues are gonna be dealt with in that study, provided it passes. Um, the department has talked about not having the capacity 
to do uh, some of these some of these reports. Certainly not by January fifteenth. Uh, and, and so our question, the, qu the question I have going back to those, which are not in the strike all amendment, are um, can we um, are in the Senate as passed. So Alan, we have a request in the chat. Can you email the Senate as passed to us so that we can see it? And then we're gonna stop conversation on that particular bill and we'll return to it later and we'll just stick to the, um, we'll stick to the uh, strike all amendment. And I will try to find a version that I can actually look at. All right, Mike, I just tried to go on that link that you that you just shared and um, it did not work or it was not found. I apologize, unless Ellen's actively doing it right now, I could email the it, it Shouldn't it be on our, shouldn't it be on our, our legislative page? The strike all is on your legislative page data. But the original version, if we go back a couple of weeks is going to be on our legislative page, right? It is. This is so irritating, my apologies. All right, I finally found my own copy of the, of the draft dated September 8th. Okay, I just emailed the as past the Senate version and I think I got all of you. Actually, maybe I missed one or two of you. So let me, <laughs> uh, so I just send it to your emails. Let me know if you didn't get it. I think Mike just sent it to you. Oh, okay. Because I definitely didn't get yours, Ellen. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well then so hopefully <laughs> between the two of us, you should have gotten it at least once. All right, and again, we'll return to, I'll, I'll do, better homework and and have the sections that we just need to we need to talk about from there when we come back from lunch. All right, so let's go. Um, Again, my committee, are we going to be more comfortable just working from start to finish rather than I, I had it in my head that I would be able to handle going backwards and go over the sections that I think are pretty um, that we've that we've considered are fairly non controversial that are in this bill um, and then return to section two and the connections to that. So um, I let's throw out some thoughts here about what's going to be easiest for us to deal with um, start to finish or, or um, or something different. Anybody can just sort of chime in. I need to start all over again because I am definitely not comfortable with where we are right now. That's why I'm stopping. Thank you. And, and I'm wondering, um, and I don't know if this would be more work than is possible in the, the time frame that we have, but um, that uh, sometimes when we've had multiple sections of bills like this, we have had the lawyer on um, on the bill just do a top level for each of the sections, so that we can see it all um, kind of all in one place. Uh, and so I don't know if that would be something that people would find helpful as we kind of go again um, through it to see. Okay, we the we agree on xyz um we don't need to dive into it oh what is again abc yes we need to dive into it and so i, I wonder if that if that would be helpful so for us as a group so let's start at the top okay and then i do want to not get hung up on section two because that's a longer deeper conversation 
and we need to we need to be really sharp about it. And I, again, people have shared their thoughts on it. We know where the flaws are. We know we made improvements after yesterday, but um, I'd like to just leave that conversation for for later. And just so let's start with Ellen. Let's start with section one. And as suggested by Representative Gonzalez, if you could just um, remind us what section one is and what it does. And then we can quickly discuss the elements of it that we remember from our uh, testimony. And did you want me to start with section one of as passed the Senate or in the proposed strike call? I think they're both the same in section one, but. No, the Senate as passed the Senate. I mean, this operates as a strike all amendment. So let's, that, that, that I left stuff out of. So let's use this because it's available to everybody right now. And um, the, the loss that we have is that, is that maybe some stuff hasn't highlighted, but if you can just go by the line numbers in case. And so I'm seeing line 19 and 20 are the, are the areas in section one that are changing. Is that right? No. What? Uh, line 19 and 20? I'm sorry, again, I'm, <laughs> I'm having some technical difficulties here, obviously. Um, the changes that were in the Senate, let's, where were the changes that happened in the Senate? Let's just, Right there, starting right there. So again, I was 19 and 20 is, is where we start. Sure. So, so section one, um, we're, in, we're talking about the uh, municipal plan requirements. And so the first amendment to the, the town plan requirements is the addition of water lines, facilities, service areas, and sewage disposal lines, facilities, and service areas to the utility and facility map as part of a municipal plan. Okay. And what else in this section was notable? And so the only other change in section one is the ch is um, adding is changing the reference in subdivision 10 from it, under current law, uh, there's a requirement that the housing element should comply with the provisions of the, the ADU provisions, but we've broadened the language to say the program shall comply with the requirements of 4412, which includes the new inclusive development provisions. And what we heard about this is some people felt like we wanted, they needed to keep this private. Um, and we also heard that it is um, every other element of planning that has been fit into this category has gone off fairly seamlessly and that, um, and that this bill allows for an opt out. So um, that's where this section is. Does anybody have any um, questions on this representative Zott? I just had a question. My recollection was that there seemed to be some concern also from witnesses about the cost of producing this information. Did I miss, am I misremembering that? Uh, my memory is that the uh, testimony about the money that it costs to map, period, is very expensive. And that the notion of, um, uh, not just this, but the perspective, um, which is existing language, right? It's perspective community facilities and public facilities. This is adding the, the water and sewer supplies to that um, requirement. And so, so, so this, the, the answer is yes, it's, it's an existing problem um, for communities. And so there's no pr proposal of funding to help communities with the expense? No, there's, there's funding that's always available. 
um, through multi, as much as we as much as we allocate money for them, which is always never enough. But there is money to um, for planning grants or our, or there are applications or opportunities for funding, um, not necessarily for the funding of the whole project, um, but certainly for the planning portions of it. And for, um, I mean, every facility takes on, every municipality seems to take on, it's, um, you know, the expense that, that this occurs and they there's a way to fund it. I think if, if Chris Cochran has a, um, a more complete way of what the process is and how it's funded, um, please share. Um, Chris Cochran for the department again. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to clarify, this is not um, requiring engineered maps or drawings for anything of that scale. It's just requiring basic, you know, lines and where they're going. And the reason this tier is in an earlier version of this bill um, that um, was removed, um, it talked about municipalities. And I think you heard this from a witness taking control of the water and wastewater connections in their community. And this is one of the most expensive assets the community has. And it seems logical to me, at least, that you know, if you're going to take on the management of this and this responsibility, which is, which is something that municipalities strongly say that they want, you should be able to know where your, where your sewer and water lines are so you can manage this asset. The other part of it too is you know, we want to link um, growth um, to areas where we've made infrastructure investments. And if you don't know where your lines are, it's really hard to do that. And the state does a great job mapping natural resource areas and tells people where they shouldn't develop. What this is trying to get it is showing areas where we can and should develop. And this information is important. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up to that, I just want to make sure because I, I understand the rationale for it, okay. which is I think more clearly what you articulated was the rationale. What I was looking to find out is how much of an additional cost burden is this for municipalities, if at all? Because it sounds like uh, you're indicating that it's not an, a, a potential uh, increase in cost. I just want to know. I think many municipalities have this already. I don't have a sense of which municipalities do have this or don't have this. So I can't really you know, tell you specifically what the costs are going to be. I, um, you know, If municipalities needed assistance with this, um, as the chair mentioned, you know, there is this municipal planning grant fund that could assist communities make update these maps as needed. So if they don't currently have the information, it would be an additional cost burden, but there are planning grants available. Yes, sir. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, Representative Hango. Thank you. And one last question for Mr. Cochran, just to reiterate then that we really don't have a handle on how many municipalities may need assistance in this mapping. Is that correct? Um, no, we do know which communities have sewer and water plants. Um, and ANR has mapped that off the top of my head. I want to say it's, it's 60 communities. Um, and these are generally our, our largest municipalities because they've been able to you know, afford to make an in infrastructure investment because they have a density that they need to support. Um, but it is not every municipality, it's just the ones with these systems. And it is just municipal systems. It's not systems you know, that are fire districts oriented. It is just municipal systems. So thank you for that. So do you think maybe it's safe to assume there are like uh, 150 small municipalities that may have water or sewer systems or both that would need to engage in this type of mapping? I have no idea. I think that number is incredibly high. I think when A&R mapped the communities that had um, sewer and water systems, and I will need to confirm it was in the range of, of 60 communities. Um, 60 that were mapped or 60 that they thought had? 60 that, that have public municipal sewer or okay. water systems. I misunderstand. Yeah. Yeah. Whether, whether they are, are mapped or not, I do not know. Okay. However, I would suspect given that there are larger, are larger are municipalities, more most more should have this information. Which ones don't, I can't answer that question. I just don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. 
I, no, that's fine. I just wanted to clarify whether um, you actually said there were 60 that were already mapped. And then I was extrapolating that there are about 250 in the state and maybe 50 of those were far too small to have any. So I was giving it the benefit of the doubt that maybe there were 150 left to do their mapping. But if it's 60 who actually have systems, then that's um, a little bit of a different story. So thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. Okay, further thoughts on section one? All right, um, moving on then to, uh, I guess, section three. Ellen, if you can scroll us forward. Section and, Ellen, and Ellen, how are you for time? Are you just, how's that Senate committee going for you? Uh, I drafted the amendment. They're going to vote on it shortly, so I'm fine. Okay. Um, did you wanted to skip to section? So we, that was section one. Yeah. Do you want to jump to section three? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'd like to bypass okay. section two for right now. Thank you. Okay. So section, uh, so in the version as passed by the Senate, section three is the language regarding um, restrictive covenants and deeds. And that is on page nine in the as pass version. And I moved it to section. Wait, okay. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. So, and the strike all proposal does not have any changes to that language. Um, but I did move it to section four um, and it's not so, but I didn't change any of the language. So this, um, so this language adds a new uh, statute in title 27, which is the, I believe the property law title. And so um, this is saying that for municipalities that adopt bylaws, um, implementing the inclusive development provisions, um, deed restrictions, covenants, and similar binding agreements, um, new deed restrictions and covenants uh, cannot uh, be, um, cannot be added to get around these in inclusive development provisions. So um, it's invalidating provisions that would conflict with them. So this goes hand in hand with section two. It does, yes. Okay, so then let's leave that there. That's it's, um, and move to the next section, please. Sure, um, and then section four is the report on substantial uh, municipal constraints. Uh, also related to section two. Okay, and this is important in terms of the uh, remembering that, and again, this won't, that this is tied into sections two and three, but this is, um, if I'm not mistaken, this is saying, this is anticipating that this bill doesn't go that these bylaw requirements do not go into effect completely legally on the books until um, 2023, as we've written the bill right now. So if we pass something right now on these bylaws and requiring municipalities to the uh, or enticing or whatever the case may be, uh, municipalities to write these bylaws, um, this report is to be issued at the onset of when this is going to take a, take effect. But it has this two year period of where people are saying, I can't do this or I don't, you know, we, we as a municipality don't want to do this. And they file this report. Um, yes. And so the department, uh, so this section four is having the Department of Housing and Community Development come back and let the legislature know how many municipalities have also have already asked um, to opt out and say, I, we have uh, municipal constraints. 
right? And the, and the state would, when applied, the state would approve or deny, but then they're taking this information and compiling it into a report. So in two years, we'll know not just which communities have, have uh, chosen to opt out, but also why, um, which, which is, has been an expressed goal of, of having this system in place of not just saying, um, you know, we respect your, you know, your, your choice to not do it or your inability to do it. Um, and, and we want to know why that's the case. So I think that's, am, am I getting that right, Chris? Um, one clarification, I, there's no approval or denial. You're just submitting the facts and the, the department is, is receiving that and then reporting on the, re the information that the municipality shared with us. So, so a town isn't applying to, to be removed. To, uh, they're just saying, we can't do it. We can't do it. And here's the reasons why. Okay, so the state doesn't, again, the state doesn't approve. They, they don't say, we don't believe you. They're going to say thank you and, and take this information and move forward. Okay. And, and the intent of this is to create, you know, we, we have had housing barriers forever and, you know, regulations is a part of the problem, but it's also, there are other barriers that we need to address. And there's been no formal collection of, of the data and information needed to overcome these barriers. So we would hope that this report would be an informative conversation to help municipalities identify and remove barriers. Okay, Representative Hango had a question. Sorry, having trouble unmuting myself. Um, so I have um, a comment to call everyone's attention to the chat because um, we've we've heard from Alex Weingarten that um, it depends on our intent of this mapping. It could be um, potentially costly. And um, also, Chris, thank you very much for correcting that the VLCT says that there are 92 facility or municipalities with um, wastewater facilities, not 60. And there, there is an unknown number that have not been mapped. So we do need to remember that there will be a significant cost regardless, um, which I'm sure municipalities will ask the state to contribute to. So my that those were my comments. My question is um, opting out of the um, opting out. If a municipality decides to opt out, we heard early on that that municipality would then kind of fall to the bottom of the, the pecking order in terms of certain tax credits and grants. Um, is this still the case? We have not changed that anywhere or proposed to change that language. Is, is, can someone answer whether that's still correct? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, um, yeah, I can answer. Um, there's, there's no, there's no disincentive for not, for not, com you know, com meeting or not. Uh, file. There's, if you file the opt out or not, um, there's no disincentive. What there is is for communities that are making progress um, on meeting the compliance, they are given preference. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's a distinction. Um, what that preference is and to the degree of preference is undefined. Um, in past programs, we've given communities a few extra points um, if they've met a statewide priority. Um, it's not gonna make the difference between a project getting funded or not, but it, it may um, help a project on the bubble. Thank you, that's a, a nice spin on that, but I'm still gonna say that they're probably not gonna be eligible for everything that a community who stays in would, but thank you. Um, can I add one thing? I don't have my notes in front of me, Chris, and so I don't know if you have your notes, but this um, language regarding priority of incentives and funding actually appears in a few other statutes that exist already. So this is a similar priority system that does exist um, that like Chris was just saying, and I did have the list out somewhere in this file is the list of other statutes that use a priority system like this. So I don't know if Chris has the list in front of him, but it is, um, I would agree to say that it is sort of a point system that there are multiple areas under statute that exist where you could get 
a priority point. So then if the um, municipality decides to opt out of several different things, you know, you're not, you're not getting on the bandwagon. So therefore you're probably going to get left behind. I think that the carrot system that's in place or the incentive system with these designated areas um, and the various state programs, again, they've been in place for a very long time and the not the, the, the feeling that someone is going to get bumped to the bottom, I think is misrepresenting a little bit about what how this process works. Um, a community may have uh, qualifications or may get points for other things. But this is this doesn't take them from being oh this must happen to it's never going to happen and I don't think any state priority program is like that it is dependent on funding, it is depending on on the quality of the application and the need and so I I just I'm going to push back and say that they're going to move to the bottom of the barrel, um, or the bottom of the list if they don't achieve what's going on here. There are enticements here, as, as, as it was said earlier, these are incentives to move in this direction. They're not disincentives. They don't, they're not penalties for, um, you know, for not joining the system. It, I, just, I just have to make, make that clear. Rep, um, <laughs> Representative Weinhagen, I'm sorry, I'm jumping the gun. You haven't been elected yet. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so this is Alex Weinhagen, and I've been holding my tongue, but doing a little chatting on the chat. Um, and just, again, thanks for having me uh, legislative liaison for the Vermont Planners Association, um, speaking on their behalf today. Also the Director of Planning and Zoning for Heinsburg, not speaking on behalf of the town, but bringing that experience. I just wanted to point out a couple things. One, that um, the way Section 4 in the strike call uh, amendment is is constructed, which is similar to what the Senate version was. Um, these these provisions that uh, do not allow private covenants um, to um, prohibit activities and uses that the municipality allows through its zoning um, is tied to whether or not um, whether or not the municipality is in compliance with or, or um, is addressing the um, uh, the inclusive housing provisions. Uh, and so to some extent that that's a little bit of a ding um, for municipalities that aren't. Um, so I agree that in general, uh, municipalities who uh, file the report and are, and are saying we can't meet those requirements um, are not being uh, negatively impacted, uh, but they are a little bit in this particular section. And I would suggest that there's no reason that this, this is breaking new ground with regard to private homeowners association covenants and making sure that they don't disallow things that the state has an interest in um, with regard to housing. Uh, I, I would argue that we don't need to tie that to whether a municipality has adopted the inclusive, inclusive housing provisions that, um, that that could be disconnected and just uh, be a matter of state policy in the same way that the state uh, disallowed uh, co private covenants from limiting energy efficiency measures like um, having a clothesline um, several years back. Okay, thank you. Oh, and one other clarification, just because uh, Representative Hango had been talking about the impact to municipalities for mapping uh, water and sewer lines. We just should be clear that there these opt-outs that we're referring to don't don't have anything to do with that section of the bill. Um, so those mapping requirements are requirements for a, a municipal plan. Um, and there's no way to opt out of those uh, the way this is structured. You know, if if you are going to have a municipal plan, um, you, you'll need to do that mapping, uh, which I per personally, I don't think is very onerous, um, or would include a lot of cost. If the understanding is that um, we're not looking for highly precise or super accurate maps of these water lines, but a general understanding of where they are. And my my understanding is that is that um, I guess I guess I have to phrase it: if and when the municipal the municipalities gain control over their municipal systems in a way that's different from now, that it makes not just legislative sense, but business sense to know where the lines are going. I mean, that's, that's 
I think what this is talking to. Am I am I misinterpreting that? Not at all. And I, I agree with, with Chris that it makes perfect sense um, for a municipality when they're creating a comprehensive plan to understand where your water and wastewater service areas are, where your lines extend to, where they stop. Um, and that all makes perfect sense. It, it's just, I know as a municipal planner that our, my own water and wastewater folks, um, if I was to tell them uh, that the state was now requiring a, a highly precise map um, of where those lines are, uh, that could be construed as a, as, a, as a large cost burden to do a whole lot of um, uh, understanding of where underground facilities are that they might not have. But from a town planning standpoint, um, whether the line is, is um, specifically in front of this house in this location, or perhaps it's on the other side of the road, um, makes very little difference as long as it's a general understanding that there's a line that runs through that neighborhood in that general location and that it's within the service area. Okay. Um, Representative Zott, and it is 1156, so we'll pick up this conversation after Representative Zott, and let's, we'll, we'll see if we have time, Lisa, for your question. Um, yeah, this is just sort of tied into the most recent comments from the Vermont uh, Planners Association is, and this is always a question, I think, with legislation, not knowing how um, precise to be in the legislation itself. So, you know, if the understanding is that it's just a general, you know, location of lines thing, great, but I just, I just want to make sure that somewhere, somehow, that that is what is actually enacted and not down the road, a municipality finds out that they have to actually do these highly technical and precise, um, produce these plans and documents in a highly precise manner. And in the same regard, um, the opt-out provision, unless it's addressed later in the legislation and I missed it, as long as it is, again, not just understanding that all a municipality has to do is say that they're not participating and it's fine, um, and we specify that in some way, otherwise just kind of leaving it to these vague understandings, uh, you know, trust but verify, as Mr. Reagan once said. Okay, uh, Representative Hango. I just wanted to build on that, the comments about the um, study, uh, the mapping of the lines, I really cannot fathom that a casual mapping of the lines, not knowing whether the house is on the east or the west side of the line is going to be helpful going forward. I unfortunately have, have the uh, pleasure of living in a house full of engineers and that would not fly. So I, I, would be, I would be hesitant to even recommend to a municipality that they do something that um, is that casual in terms of going through a mapping process. And that's just a comment. I don't need a um, response. Thank you. All right. Um, and uh, Alex, I suppose on a lighter note, I hope, um, if my town, which um, let's say they can't see my white, but my water connection in what passes for my front lawn um, or front yard here next to the sidewalk, uh, and they dig up the road and can't find my connection. How much does that cost? How much does it cost to 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 find your connection? To to dig wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't give you an actual dollar amount, but it's um, it's not it's not inexpensive. Um, so it certainly pays to know where your lines are. Um, but if you talk to the folks that manage these facilities, um, they will tell you that you you there are you do have to do some digging, um, and that the precision of uh, of knowing exactly where a line is um, just isn't there in all cases. So th there's no, there's no. We we experienced that on we experienced that very much in downtown Waterbury, and we're finally fixing it. Um, if we want to be worried about what points mean and priorities, it only took 35 years for Main Street to get redone. So um, thank you, everybody. It's 11.59. Go have a quick lunch, and we'll see you back here at 12.30. Bob, um, quick question. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Do yeah. we use the same link now to get back to the afternoon meeting? Mike, is that how we set it up? 
Um, so Ron had set it up as two distinct um, meetings, but um, we can use the same. You know, I don't know if we can use the same one or not. I, so I'll, if we, I'll if everybody that, still has, if Mike, uh, Mike, if you could just send us all before 1230, if you can send us another link, whatever it may be, that would be um, the most efficient okay. way. Thank I will. you. I'll send it to everyone that I see on the screen right now. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. See you in a bit. Um, but including Representative Oops. Blackie as well, because he'll be back um, for the afternoon session. Yes, correct. The whole committee. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great.